Now I gotta say, I'm pretty impressed. I've been playing around with this chat GPT AI bot for the past couple of weeks. I've been asking it anything from the meaning of life to write me a specific app in Flutter to various other questions, various other thoughts. And I am beginning to realize there's so much to it. There's so many more things that you can do with it. And I have seen people doing amazing things with it. People have been asking various questions. There are people even getting it to act as a virtual machine and create an alternate reality. And so we are just pretty much at the beginning. There's so many things that you can do. Now, what I've noticed, one of the most important things when it comes to actually dealing with this bot and getting it to help you and getting it to understand your question is the way you formulate your prompt. I have seen people trade and share their own prompts, meaning the question, the exact question they're formulating, because me and you can be looking for a solution to the same problem, and I can get the bot to respond with the correct answer, but you may not, and that really depends on the way we formulate the prompt. And so I have seen lots of threads, lots of discussions on places like Twitter and elsewhere, people sharing their prompts. And so for instance, if you Google for chat GPT prompts, you can see lots of different results, people sharing uh, specific ways of asking a specific question, that's gonna yield um, a result, that's gonna get the bot to understand it and give you the results. And it seems that the prompts actually make a huge, huge difference. For instance, here we have a page, 100 best uh, chat GPT prompts to unleash AI's potential. Pretty cool web page, uh, lots of different ideas. Even I thought I can, you know, ask it uh, the question the right way, but I have even seen people ask questions in ways I would have never thought to ask a question before. Here you have a uh, blog article that teaches you how to write the perfect prompt. And it's actually pretty interesting because if you scroll down, you can kind of see good prompts versus bad prompts. You have another um, site here that shares with you various prompts, various ways of asking it questions. Here is another site. Uh, that kind of talks about different prompts. And so, in other words, it really does make a big difference of the way you formulate the question. And so, looking at all this, seeing people formulate the right, the wrong way uh, to ask this bot for a question, and realizing that the way you formulate the question is going to make all the difference in getting the answers that you need, I wanted to come up with some kind of a solution so that all of us as a community can come together and share different prompts and learn from each other. And so what I did is I actually sat down and in about two hours, I built, tested and launched a no code app uh, using Flutterflow that allows people to share their prompts and even upvote and downvote uh, some of the prompts that they're seeing. Now, before we continue, I'm super excited today to announce the launch of my new Flutterflow training, Mastering Flutterflow. This is the training that I've been working for the past several months. My first ever training in the many years of running this channel. And after I discovered Flutterflow, I immediately realized that this is the tool of the future. And this is the best tool out there for building no code apps quickly and easily. And my course covers just that. And in my course, you will learn everything that you need to know when it comes to Flutterflow from beginning to end. And I guarantee you that after you finish my training, you will know exactly where to start and how to build the kind of app that you want to build. Joining my training also comes with amazing benefits that you're going to see in the description below. And after working on it for as long as I have, I really hope to see you there inside this new community. Check out the link in the description below. As always, all the apps I'm going to be showing you in today's video are going to be available to view and or clone from my Patreon page, which you're going to find in the description below this video. Now, first, let me show you the app. So we're not going to preview this app. I actually want to show you this app live because this app has been published on the internet. It's available to everybody. Everybody can access it and everyone can use it. And so this app is called Chat GPT Prompts. 
And it's a very, very simple app, but there's a couple of things that it does really, really well. So here it says, check out some cool chat GPT prompts. You can click this button and you're gonna have this dialog box kind of pop up, this inline dialog box. And here I can share a cool prompt. So I can type something like, teach me about Flutter flow using wrap. And we can save that. And once we save it, you're going to see the prompt here. You can upvote it, you can downvote it, and we have the date of the prompt. Now, if you click this button here, you decide you don't want to enter anything here. You can just click back. That's going to close it. So it's a very, very simple, but a very useful app, in my opinion. And it took me just a couple of hours to design and code using Flutterflow. And this is a one page app. It does a couple of things, but in my opinion, it does them really, really well. And so this app is live right now on the internet. It has been fully launched, fully published. And I'm going to be sharing this link to the app in the description below. So hopefully you guys can check it out and share with the community some of your favorite prompts, as well as check out some of the prompts that have been shared. So now that you've seen the app, let's go into Flutterflow and I can show you how I build this app, some of the functionality, some of the tips and tricks that allowed me to build this app very, very quickly. Now, here we are inside the app. And one of the first things I realized is that this is going to be purely a web app, it's going to be a responsive web app. So regarding whether you know, you're going to access it from your phone, from you know, a tablet, or you know, using a web browser, uh, it's going to arrange itself so that it's uh, showing up exactly how you want it. So you're not seeing, you know, it show up one way on one device and another way on another device. And so this is not going to be an app that you're going to be using on a mobile device. Okay. It's possible, you know, to have this app working on a mobile device as a separate app, but I just focused on making it a web app. And if you go into settings and integrations, you can go to platforms and you can select web. So Android and iOS are selected by default. And you can enable this option that's going to enable a couple of other features that I'm going to talk about in just a second. By enabling this, it's also going to open up a couple of other features that I'm going to cover in just a minute. So if we go back to the app, we have our basic screen here, we have this right here, you know, your regular text right here, then we have this button. Now, what happens with this button is we have a workflow. Okay, so with this button, we are tracking are we in an ad state? Or are we not in an ad state? Because if I go over here, if I go to my local state, I have an ad state boolean, which is a true or false. And by default, it's false. So you're not in an ad state. Because depending on the ad state, we're going to be showing this little prompt, or this prompt is going to be hidden. So when you click on this button, it set, it updates this local state to be true. Okay, so if I open this up, it basically changes it. So I'm not updating it to be true, I'm setting it to the opposite of the initial value. So it's like a toggle. Okay, so by default, it's not in an ad state. And the first time you click on it, it's now in the ad state. And then if you click on it again, it's not going to be in the ad state. And you do that by setting it to a variable that's the opposite of the variable. Okay, that's kind of a little, um, a little technique to do that. So if I click here, we are setting it to this local state add state, but we're using the up, we're applying the opposite. So that's a really nice technique to negate it. And you do that in programming, it's nice, you can also do that here in Flutterflow. Now this whole thing, this container, if you come over here, this container, as you can see, you have that eye icon, if you go all the, way, all the way up, you have conditional visibility. So if you expand this, you see it's based on add state. Okay, so, re, you know, if add state is true, show it. If add state is false, don't show it. And that's why it, it has that nice uh, kind of um, effect on it, right? You can add that, it opens up, you can do that, it closes down. Uh, the other thing that you can do is you can have a pop-up pop dialog box, you can have like a, a drawer, I believe it's called that kind of, you know, goes from the bottom to the top kind of pulls up, you can do that. But I figured this is a nice effect. So we have that little pattern that you can use inside of your apps. I think it's really clean, and really nice. 
So we have that, and this is an icon button. It obviously has a, a flow here. Now, this thing here, right, we have a save button. Now, the save button does a couple of things. If you open this up, there's a bunch of actions. The first is we're validating form because this whole thing is a form. I don't know if I've ever talked about forms before, but uh, Flutter and Flutterflow have something called a form. And inside the form, you can do validation. Okay, so we have this form. And then if you click on this form, if you scroll down, you have these input elements. And you can do validation on these input elements. So I'm validating it. So if you go back to the app, if I type, hey, and I do save, it requires at least 10 characters. So this is really, really nice because you're always going to be doing validation unless it's like a really, really minor test app. Most of the time you're going to be doing validation. So it requires at least 10 characters. You can do other validations. You can do custom validation, right? So if you come in here, you have text validator, you have username, email, website, you could do custom regex. Regex is a regular expression. That means you can make sure that the input you are um, entering can be pretty much anything, okay? So I'm doing a minimum required characters. So you can't add a prompt if it's like one word or two words. We want something longer, right? A good prompt is going to be like maybe at least like 20, 25 characters or something like that. And so if we come over here, we're doing validation. We're creating this new um, prompt in our Firebase DB that I'm going to show you in just a second. And then we're updating local state. We're setting add state to false. Or we can also set it to the opposite because it's going to be true. If you're seeing the prompt, it's going to be true. You can set it to opposite. But in this case, it makes more sense to not toggle it, but just to set it to false. It's just, it's logically correct in my view. Whereas this thing is a pure toggle. This is not a toggle. This kind of turns it off. But you guys get, get the idea. You can, uh, you can do this as a toggle if you want. But this is definitely a toggle here. Now, if we come over here, we have this thing right here, this list view here. And this list view is gotten from a database. So we have a backend query prompts, uh, gets a list of document, and I am doing an order by timestamp decreasing. So I want to show the more recent prompts uh, in the beginning before the other prompts. So that is kind of what we have here. And if we come over here to our Firestore, we just have a regular Firestore. We have users, uh, which is the default uh, for authentication. So later on, if I want to add authentication to it, um, I already have the users. And then we have the prompts. So we have name, the number of points, the user ID, and the timestamps. I'm not using the user ID. You don't need to log in. We're not doing authentication. But later on, if I want to add authentication, which is something uh, you should probably do because you have upload, uh, uploads and downloads, you want to track it. You want to make sure it's one per user, not like one user can do as many as they want. But I trust you guys that you're just going to do it once, once at a time. Uh, so, you know, that's going to be a good idea in the production app. And then we have timestamp as well. And obviously we have a Firebase, a corresponding Firebase database that stores all of this here. Now, another nice thing to do with this app is that you can have another page that shows comments, right? So somebody has a, um, they have a prompt and somebody can leave a comment, right? That's going to be a sub collection inside a prompt. That's kind of the best way of doing it. Now, let's take a look at this list view right here. Let me quickly show you how that works. Uh, we have this list view, and obviously we have this name, that's uh, that the name of the prompt that we have here, the variable. And then we have these icons here. So this icon right here, very simple. All it does is it uh, has the reference to the current prompt, the, the document reference, and we're just doing an update. We're doing increment, and then we're specifying a value. So this is nice. They have this increment, delete, update, uh, increment. So I don't need to write a custom function, add one, right? If they didn't have that, I would need a custom function. Whereas this right here, it does a decrement, right? So if you open this up, we also have a condition, okay? So we want to make sure that the minimum point is going to be one. They all start with one point, okay? So if it's greater than one, we can uh, decrement it. If it's, um, if it's not greater than one, meaning that it's uh, equal or less than uh, one, so if it's equal to one or less than one, there's no point of decrementing, it's already one. So we check if it's greater than one, so if it's like two or more, 
yes, you can uh, decrease it by one. Then we have a backend call. Same thing here. We're doing a decrement by one. That is kind of what we have. And now we are also here. We are displaying the date. Okay, so here we're displaying the date. And that is kind of all we have. Very, very simple app. And, and after I was done, I tested the app using the test mode and all that. I went to settings and integrations and I went to web publishing. This is a really nice feature here in Flutterflow. It's integrated, right? So you can specify a site URL, which is essentially a subdomain on Flutterflow that apps uh, the main here. And this is kind of what I specify, which is the name of the app. You can also do a custom domain here as well. And then you just uh, hit publish and it's going to um, render the site. It's going to compile the site into JavaScript, right? HTML and JavaScript. And then it's going to push it to this URL, which is controlled by Flutterflow. So maybe, you know, they're using some kind of a cloud service probably. Now, it's important to understand that uh, once you're done with your app, and you launch it here, um, obviously, you need to have a Flutterflow account. If you don't, then this is not going to work, right? But there are ways of um, taking your code that you built uh, using Flutterflow, taking it out and launching it on the server of your choice, right? So you can take all the code, and you can launch it. That's, you know, a server that you control, okay, I've done that before, very, very easy to do. I know some people asked, okay, what, what happens after I, you know, I cancel my account, I leave Flutterflow and all that. What happens to my app? Well, nothing happens. You can take your app and you can launch it anywhere that you want. I'm going to have a dedicated video on how exactly you can do that uh, sometime in the future. But rest assured, you can do that. And so my purpose in building this small app is twofold. Number one, obviously, is the community aspect. I want it uh, for you guys to use it to share some of your prompts that you're trying to use. Uh, I wanted other people to learn uh, what other people are doing their own prompts. So there's the community aspect. So hopefully you guys are going to use it. I'm going to be adding my favorite prompts. I've been using chat GPT uh, very, very heavily lately just doing other projects. And so I'm going to be sharing my own prompts, you guys are going to see it on the app. But the second reason I decided to build it is I wanted to show you how you can build a project from beginning to end very, very quickly. It took me like a couple of hours to design, test and release it and launch it on the internet, right? This is a nice app. In my opinion, it's not a complex app. But when you're starting out, you do not need to build a complex app. The goal here is to launch something you want to launch something that works with a minimal uh, feature set. Okay, I want you know, I'm thinking this app is going to have a ton more features. But right now I want to test it out. I want to just get it out there and see what you guys think. See what the community thinks. Do you guys like it? Do you guys not like it? And I also wanted to show you guys how I built it. And this is a perfect example of an app that doesn't have a billion features, doesn't have all the bells and whistles, but does a couple of things really, really well. So I encourage all of you to go out and do the same thing, create something useful, publish it and gain that valuable experience. Now, if you guys are super interested in no code and are interested in taking your knowledge to the next level, or a couple of levels beyond what you're doing now, then you definitely want to check out my Patreon page, not only will you have access to all the code, all the apps that I built on this channel, including this app, and pretty much all the other Flutterflow apps, I've done before, including other apps with other no code builders, but you will also get access to other content, things like live streams, Q and A's, my masterclass series, some of the other series I'm planning on doing lots and lots of cool things are happening. And typically, these are going to be videos that are much more in depth than the videos on this channel, because I realize that people who are part of that community are interested in a lot of in depth content. And so joining my Patreon community is a great way to gain more knowledge and an awesome way to support this channel and supporting my work. So if you have not yet joined, I really look forward to seeing you there. The link is in the description below the video. And so that will do it for today's video. I really, really hope you've gotten value here. If you did give this video a like, leave a comment below if you have any questions or concerns subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet done so. And I will talk to you in a future video.